Okay, John, they're starting to come in. Okay, great. Oh, wait, just, just a couple seconds. No, I'm good. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Jonathan Godbout, um, faculty director of the Chronic Ranger Program, and it's, I'm delighted to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Jennifer Bogner, who's from the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. She holds a Burt Wiley Professor Chair. She's also an affiliate member of the Chronic Brain Injury Program. She is a board certified psychologist. She got her PhD from psychology at OSU um, and has a number of uh, research awards and TBI, including a 2019 um, award from the Brain Injury Association of America. And she's on several grants and uh, a more recent grant that I think she'll, she'll announce uh, to you today that she got from the NINDS. Uh, really exciting. Congrats on that. Um, and she'll tell, share some of her work today on TBI model systems. And this is a uh, you know, big longitudinal data, data set that's national and local. And she's a co-PI of the local branch of this model systems here at OSU. Um, Dr. Wagner has many, many publications in this area of, of TBI and, and functional recovery and rehabilitation. Um, and so we're really delighted to have her. Um, as part of this Buckeye Neurotrauma Lecture, which is uh, being done today as a hybrid model. So I'll do, um, uh, Dr. Bodner is there in person in BRT. You can go join her there and have some coffee and bagels. Or if you're watching on the internet here, uh, you can join us during Zoom. So we're gonna try to do these hybrid models for, for our lectures. Um, KDAR is also gonna throw in some things uh, um, CBI related into the chat. Uh, I didn't wanna waste, I didn't wanna taken too much more of Dr. Bogner's time, so I, I'm not going to announce them, but you can look from there. And we'll talk about them next week, too. We have a, a another uh, lecture next Friday for NT RIPS. So with that, uh, Dr. Bogner, glad you're here and you're doing in person and really excited to see your work you've been doing with the TBI model systems. Thank you. Thanks, John. I appreciate the introduction. Um, I'm really excited today to talk to all of you about the TBI model systems. You know, it's funny, um, I used to, uh, when we first became a model system, I had um, uh, pulled out the slide deck for the TBI model systems and gone around and talked to everyone about it and just kind of told people about it. And at that time, we really only talked about the longitudinal data set. And this time, you know, we've got the standard deck that we use for the national data set and I pulled it out and there are 81 slides. And I realized, you know, and I've known this, I've been living with it for, for years now, but we've expanded so much in terms of, it's not just a longitudinal data set anymore. I mean, the collaborative projects that we're doing, the translation and translational materials that we've developed, um, the implementation science that we've begun to, uh, to understand and, and start to try to implement ourselves. All of those different things are things that have truly expanded the model systems. And we're now just, um, you know, we're, we're funded by NIDLER, a National Institute on Disability Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research, which is in the administration of community living. It's not an NIH project of the TBI model systems. Many people think it, that it is because it says National Institute, but it's actually NIDLER. Um, but beyond that, we're also, because of our collaborative projects, we're working with CDC, we're working with the VA, we're working with DOD, we're working with PCORI, and we're working with NIH. So um, the TBI model systems is kind of the core for many of us who model, model systems um, sites, but there's so much more that's going on, and I want to hopefully touch on that. Now, if folks know me at all, they know I tend to go straight to the details and miss some of the forest. So I'm gonna try really, really hard today to be concentrating on the forest and, and we'll see how, how well I do. And first I gotta figure out how to move this thing. Let's see. There we go.
Okay, so the TBI model systems was the first prospective longitudinal study of persons with traumatic brain injury that looks at the recovery and long-term course of traumatic brain injury within a coordinated system of care that goes from the emergency medical systems to through rehab through long-term follow-up. It's actually the world's largest longitudinal study of traumatic brain injury. There are other studies that have started since then, but we're still the largest at this point uh, for folks with moderate and severe traumatic brain injury. We're currently following up people at 30 years post-injury. So that gives you an idea of just how long we've been doing this. And TBI model systems was not the first model system that was developed. There was actually, there's actually three different types of model systems. The spinal cord injury model system was first developed in 1970. And it's actually a line item in the government budget, the US government budget. So that was established in 1970. Then the TBI model systems came about in the 1980s. Um, actually, um, it has 1987 here, but a lot of the planning began in 1983. Um, at that point, there were only five centers. And then in 1998, it was expanded to 17 centers. And what you're gonna hear later is that the Ohio Regional TBI model system actually came in in 1997. And that's because um, there is a grant cycle that renews these, the sites every five years. And because that grant cycle is competitive, um, some, grant, some sites go on to continue to be sites and some sites um, drop out and other sites replace them. We replaced a site in 1997. Currently there are 16 centers and there's three follow-up centers. And that what that means is that sometimes a site will um, lose funding for a cycle, but they're given funding by our, our National Data uh, and Statistical Center to continue their follow-ups. Because as you can imagine, if we have, um, if, we're, if we are recompeting every five years and we're trying to maintain a longitudinal data set and then a site loses funding, that means all of those participants in the, at that site would not be followed. So um, as a contingency plan, some funds are set aside for sites that lose funding so that they can continue to follow up. And then we also have a burn model system, so which was established later and, and currently has four centers. The overall priorities for the TBI model systems is to contribute to evidence-based rehabilitation um, interventions and to, and to ultimately contribute to clinical and practice uh, guidelines to improve the lives of persons with traumatic brain injury. Now, obviously you can't do that with just a longitudinal study, although the longitudinal study does, does a lot to contribute towards that. So this is gonna get, start to give you an idea of, of how much more we're doing. But uh, the model system centers, in order to be a model system site, you must have a coordinated system of care and it must go from the EMS all the way through follow-up. And it must, be, it must provide comprehensive inpatient rehabilitation services um, in addition to the acute care and the follow-up services. The participants are actually enrolled in the study when they get to inpatient rehabilitation. In addition to maintaining a longitudinal study, which you also need to do in order to be a site, is that you need to be conducting one local um, uh, study. Um, and oftentimes those local studies are tend to be intervention studies, but not necessarily. Um, then you need to participate in at least one module study or multi-center study. And so when we, when we submit our grants, we have in those grants, um, grant proposals, a uh, local project um, and a research design behind that. And then we're also proposing a multi-center project. And when uh, we go through the competition and, um, and we, the uh, sites are identified for funding, then at that point, the modules are selected by the sites to go forward. We also obviously have to collect and submit data for the longitudinal data set. And then um, we also have the opportunity with additional funding to uh, participate in collaborative research grants. That's an additional grant in Alberta above the model systems grant. And then we're also required to translate our findings 
so that it can be used by stakeholders, both clinicians and persons living with traumatic brain injury. This shows the currently funded sites in blue. Those are the 16 sites in blue. And we all currently have two follow-up centers being funded. And you can see here in gray, the centers that lost funding that are not currently following any patients. So this is a loss for the longitudinal study because that means that we only have limited data on the uh, folks who um, were enrolled at these particular sites. The current um, topics, I'm showing this to you so you can get a, an idea of the range of, of topic areas that are being uh, addressed through the local projects. So we've got, again, the longitudinal study, but then we also have some drill down studies that are done at each of the different sites. And the drill down studies are usually ones that are, um, they're doing either an intervention study, as you can see here with the resilience studies, the COG rehab studies, um, emotional dysregulation studies. Um, and so they're going beyond a longitudinal data set and they're actually conducting an intervention study. Now, the money that we get from the model systems is actually not all that much. So usually these intervention studies are uh, smaller scale studies. Um, sometimes they're, they're generating preliminary data. Sometimes they're sufficient enough in terms of their sample size to um, actually come up with um, uh, firm conclusions, but it's but it, it does these tend to be smaller scale studies because of the limits on the budget. Alternatively, a site can um, uh, do more of an observational type of study, um, oftentimes in preparation for a, a, a later intervention. So, for example, at Ohio State, we're doing um, uh, ecological momentary assessments. Our study is looking at physiological markers that might predict later decline um, following traumatic brain injury. But we're actually looking at individuals right after their injury, and we're collecting information on heart rate variability um, and immune, uh, immune system biomarkers and the metabolic system biomarkers. And then we're collecting uh, through ecological momentary assessments, um, basically pinging people through their phone, we're collecting data on on their cognition and so we're having them do a cognitive task and on their mood. And we're going to be looking at the relationship between those fluctuations in mood and cognition and the biomarkers. And with the heart rate variability being a continuous measure that's, that's, that pers the person is we wearing throughout the day. So we don't have any results on that yet. So I won't be talking any more about that, but that'll be something that'll come later. We also have a number of module studies that are being conducted this year, these, this cycle, as well as the chronic, a chronic pain collaborative study. So that's one of those studies that brings in additional money. And so that's a very large scale study that, that's trying to characterize chronic pain after um, brain injury and also look at the treatment practices that are being conducted. And Dr. Cynthia Beaulieu here at Ohio State is representing Ohio State on that study. I'm going to talk a little bit about the national data set. So in order for someone to be enrolled in the, in the national data set, they need to fit, uh, fit the case definition for TBI. And basically, it's um, uh, damage to the brain caused by an external force um, that um, has neurological findings that, that can be reasonably attributed to the TBI. It does not include folks with other acquired brain injuries, such as anoxia, or stroke. It's um, only the person must have had a traumatic brain injury. Now, if they have anoxia or stroke on top of the traumatic brain injury, they're in, but, um, but they must have the traumatic brain injury. The other inclusion criteria and probably um, of the most importance is that the person has to have been admitted um, to inpatient rehabilitation within one of the model systems hospitals. And they have to receive all of their care within the model system. So, um, and that, that has created difficulties uh, uh, lately because sometimes um, folks are coming into acute care um, in, into the hospital. And then because of the need to urgently um, uh, turn over beds in the hospitals, um, some folks have ended up going to SNFs rather than the inpatient rehabilitation that they need. 
Um, and so not only has that uh, been harmful to the patients, but it's also um, in compromising the study samples because we are no longer getting as many uh, folks being admitted to inpatient rehab as we did before. Otherwise, it has to be a moderate and severe traumatic brain injury. Um, it, it, the person has to have been admitted within 72 hours. This is an adult and adolescent study. And obviously they need to have provided informed consent or a guardian or family member has. The database itself has its own objectives, basically to find out more about short and long-term outcomes, to study the long-term the long -term outcomes as well as the clinical course um, and then also we look at the relationship between what we're finding in our data set and other data sources. And so that's where we've done a lot of collaboration with the CDC in order to look more carefully at the extent to which our, our, we can generalize from our findings to the larger um, population of individuals with moderate and severe traumatic brain injury. The method involves um, enrolling individuals while they're receiving inpatient rehabilitation and collecting data from the medical records and from them um, regarding um, their background and their injury itself and, and the course itself. And then after they're discharged, we call them on the phone and we do uh, uh, follow-up surveys with them at years one, two, and every five years and every five years afterwards. It's primarily by telephone. We are moving to some online data collection and sometimes folks prefer by mail or in person as well. As you can see, there's quite a few variables here. Our form one is our inpatient form that has 285 variables and our form two has 243. Just a minute, I wanna check my time. We're doing well. Um, for folks who are interested in learning more about the TBI model systems and, and what kind of data is available there, you can go to the website. It's shown right here. It's um, tbindsc.org. And if you go to the syllabus page, that will actually take you to the data dictionary, which will show you what variables we're collecting and when. So it's a, that data dictionary is very helpful because it shows not only the variables themselves, but it also shows the variable history, what we might have in archive, as well as um, what we're currently collecting. And now since the data set um, is available for public use, you can go into the data dictionary, look to see if there's some variables that you want to, that would be helpful to you for answering research questions, and then you can apply to get the data set. Um, it's widely available and it'll be a de-identified data set, which um, is a new development within the last few years. The database itself includes over 18,000 participants. So it is huge, it's absolutely huge. Um, and we've done pretty well in terms of attrition. We've actually done better in the past few years than we've than we uh, are past 15 years or so than we did in, originally. Um, originally, uh, the, the, the attrition rate for the model systems was about 40%. It was, it was pretty large. And at that time, so back in the, in the, in the 1990s, um, that was pretty typical for longitudinal studies um, is that they just, that's, that's what you got. Um, but then we did some, um, and I give a lot of credit to Dr. Corrigan at Ohio State for doing this, but we did some uh, initial studies that looked at that, that impact of losing so many people in our longitudinal studies and the systematic bias that it introduces. And we began to understand that it isn't going to impact our outcomes because you were losing folks who, um, for example, had um, strong substance abuse histories, and that would obviously um, bias the outcomes that you're you're observing. So at that time, so um, starting in the 2000s, we started in the model systems data set introducing new strategies for following individuals um, so, that, um, so that we would not lose quite so many. There are things like um, where we follow people um, in the in-between years just to make sure we haven't lost them. We follow them by the internet. 
we're constantly um, verifying their contact information and we're getting multiple sources of contact information too. So the numbers that you see here is our numbers that reflect the attrition rate from the very beginning to now. So it's like your GPA, it's cumulative, right? But when you actually look at the attrition rate at this point, it's more like 10% um, at, uh, at year one. So overall, we're following about 90% of folks at year one and close to that at year, year two and year five, it does drop down to 80% at um, the later years obviously. And these are our target goals. Um, and, you know, we don't always meet them um, to get 80% in the later years, 90% in the more recent years. But um, when we don't, we have to come up with a plan on, on what we can do about it so that we, we keep um, our attrition rate low. Some, some people have asked us about the representativeness of the database, because obviously we're we are 15 different sites distributed nationally, but we're academic medical centers for the most part, some not, but you know, we have more resources. We're, we're um, very heavily research driven um, in each of our different sites. And that may not represent all of the, all of the um, rehabilitation centers across the United States. So what, what's been done is, is that the TBML systems data set has been compared to UDS and to um, e-rehab and also there was some studies done with the CDC and um, to look to see what the representativeness was. And we're pretty good. Um, we tend to not admit as many people who are older, um, but we have a way of weighting the data set so that you can make it comparable to um, the national population. It is obviously limited though to people with moderate and severe traumatic brain injury. Other limitations that we have are a lack of control or, or a comparison group. Um, obviously it's not an intervention study, so there is no control group. We have no group there of people without brain injury in this study. That would be of great benefit. Um, lack of uniformity, uniformity in treatment across all of the centers. This is something we don't know that much about. We can only guess at that because we don't have a lot of data on that and the new study um, coming in, we'll, we'll be looking at that. The attrition we just talked about, uh, we don't have any data on post-acute utilization, um, rehab utilization. We're currently working on new variables that may be added to the data set to look at that. And the problem I talked about before in terms of centers being defunded and losing, losing um, follow-up data on those participants. So that's the national data set. Um, and you could spend hours looking at the national data set in terms of the actual data, et cetera. Um, but I wanna take another step back, look more at the forest again. Um, I also wanna talk a little bit about the collaborations that have been done. So um, we've taken the, the national data set and it's had a much greater reach by doing collaborations with the CDC. I forgot a slide on the CDC collaborations, but also with the DA and what I wanna, particularly point out to you is the VA Polytrauma Rehabilitation Centers database. So there are five different PRCs that um, distributed throughout the United States, and they are also participating at, um, just like the civilian model system sites. They have a database that's very similar to ours, uh, maybe with some different variables specific to their population, but also all of our variables as well. They follow our procedures and they are basically part of our family. And we, we, do, um, we do many, many collaborative projects with them. We've also expanded to, um, to get funding from other sources to do our collaborative projects. So one, of, one that Ohio State participated in recently was a, a study that, that was run through the Tampa PRC, Polytrauma Rehabilitation Center, and it was looking at comparing uh, level one PSGs, uh, polysomnography, and level three, the portable versions of them, and looked to see if we could accomplish um, sleep studies for sleep apnea in inpatient rehabilitation. While we were successful with doing that, um, with conducting those studies, the main study question, are the two comparable? Um, 
basically the level one is still superior to the level three, but um, we were definitely able to um, uh, uh, identify the moderate and severe apnea um, with the level three. That was pretty accurate. It was just at the milder levels that we were missing some of the folks, or we would sometimes identify apnea as mild when it was actually moderate and severe. So level three has its use um, and we haven't ruled it out. It's, it, you know, it was actually very close in terms of, of uh, being comparable, but it didn't, it didn't make the cut. We also uh, found in this study then that 70% of our folks with traumatic brain injury at these different sites had sleep apnea while they were in rehabilitation. And as you can imagine, the potential for that to impact outcomes and that person's ability to um, participate in rehabilitation. And in fact, we have um, a study on outcomes that it was some data that we didn't publish that, um, that did find a relationship be between functional outcomes, the FIM and apnea. We're also currently conducting another PCORI study. This is run, run out of uh, University of Washington. It's a very large $12 million pragmatic trial um, that compares the standard discharge plan um, to an optimized transition plan where, where um, the person is receiving some case management for six months and regular contact with a social worker or a case manager for six months following discharge. And we're looking to see if um, the regular CARF required, the accredit accreditation required standard of care is equivalent to the, uh, an optimized transition experience, or if indeed we can improve outcomes by Im improving our transitions after discharge. So turning now to the accomplishments, what have we gotten from all of this work? Well, there's over 650 publications. Nearly anything that you see on um, traumatic, moderate severe traumatic brain injury out there probably had something um, to do with TBI model systems um, or at least some of the earliest work. There's now been you know, more um, work done from different origins, but the original work that was done on traumatic brain injury and long-term outcomes came from the TBI model systems. And so it, based, it provided the foundation from which so much has now been built. So looking at prognostic factors, risk factors, um, treatment effectiveness, all of that came originally from the TBI model system. So we know now uh, uh, about the impact of uh, longer PTA. We know now about um, awareness of deficits, the impact of substance misuse, which has only been looked at by um, a few sites within the TBI model systems. We've looked at mortality, we've done a number of studies on that. And that's actually, you probably are not surprised, is linked to substance misuse or risky substance use. We've also begun to look at the trajectory um, of outcomes following traumatic brain injury. And much of our more recent work has been looking at aging with traumatic brain injury and, and trying to identify those uh, factors that could increase the risk for um, degeneration um, later down the road. So while we don't, we, we've just started to publish on aging and the develop and basically TBI as a chronic condition after TBI, we have more to come. There's many more studies that are, are in process with that. We've also developed a number of resources for stakeholders to use. Um, the Combi is a website that has uh, many of the measures that we developed or that we um, have supported um, and the data set itself. But we also have a number of fact sheets and other materials that were developed for persons with brain injuries, family members, and clinicians who work with people with brain injury. In particular, most of our work, uh, most of our translation um, documents are um, held with the Model Systems Knowledge Translation Center. So what Nidler did, our funder did, is that it, it developed separate, a fun, separate funding mechanism just for translating information, um, the research that we've learned into usable materials for persons who are living with traumatic brain injury. 
And the Knowledge Translation Center is in charge of making sure that we get those materials out and that, um, and that everyone has access to our, our knowledge. Just some of the materials that they have on this website that have to do with traumatic brain injury. They also have the SCI materials and the burn materials is we have fact sheets about a large number of issues that, that might be encountered after traumatic brain injury. Um, there's also uh, cartoons, infographics that, could, that um, might be more accessible to some individuals um, after traumatic brain injury. There's also videos. Um, oftentimes they're videos of stakeholders giving um, uh, uh, their view of their experience. But there's also videos that are coming from the experts themselves and sometimes a combination of that. So I would encourage you to go to their website and I have that in the slides here um, and look up some of those materials. It's, it, there's a wealth of materials there. So if you're working directly with patients, um, I would. I would definitely encourage you to, to explore this website because uh, why reinvent the wheel? A lot of the educational materials that you need for patients are right here. And they've all been, you know, they, they come from our research and they have been um, developed by the researchers and then there are consumers. So there's persons living with traumatic brain injury who have reviewed the materials and made sure that they would be accessible. So they, they've given their feedback so that we made the language and um, accessible to, to all, of the, um, all of the users of the documents. So that's the national data set. Um, and I hope that gave you some type of overview of what we do with the national data set and what its reach is. Now I wanna drill down a little bit to what we're doing here at Ohio State. So at Ohio State, the site here at Ohio State is called the Ohio Regional TBI Model System. And the Ohio Regional TBI model system is under the umbrella of the Ohio Valley Center for Brain Injury Prevention and Rehabilitation, which is within the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation in the College of Medicine at Ohio State University. Quite a mouthful there. Um, the OVC was established back in the 1990s and it's it's the umbrella for not only our TBI research, so all of our TBI research studies are under this, but also program development and education projects. And importantly, the OBC is also the lead agency for the state of Ohio's brain injury program. Now, I'm not gonna talk more about that today other than to say, you know, we are the lead agency. We're the agency that has helping to ensure that Ohioans living with traumatic brain injury has access to the services that they need. And it's pretty cool. Also, the budget for the Ohio Brain Injury Program was just significantly increased in, in, the, in the state budget this year. A very important component of any of the grants that are done through NIDLR, but particularly the model systems grants, is that, you that it be based on participatory action research. Um, which if you're, if you're PCORI minded would be called the same as patient engagement. But participatory action research has actually been around for decades and decades. And NIDLR has always had it as a key component of their grants. It's, it's central to the work that they do. And basically what it is, is that, uh, you know, the term nothing about, uh, nothing about us without us that's basically what participatory action research is about. It's ensuring that the persons who are living with the, the effects of traumatic brain injury, their family members as well, um, have a seat at the table and that they are helping to guide the research. They're telling us what's important to study, what's, in, what's important to them in their lives that needs to be improved. Um, and at Ohio State, well, the way that we did the participatory action research is we formed this advisory council and they truly are involved in our research from the very beginning through dissemination. What we found with participatory action research is that it makes our research so much more relevant to the persons who are using it. We, it's, it's like it, 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 um, 
it immediately gets taken up by the people who hear us talk about it as we disseminate it because it's addressing the issues that are most important to the persons with traumatic brain injury. And the feedback from the advisory council in terms of the meaning of our research has really helped us with interpreting our findings. Um, I can't tell you how many times I have puzzled over a particular finding and then presented it to the advisory council. And they're usually the first person to see it. And they have really helped me understand the meaning of that finding from the eyes of the person with traumatic brain injury. So to the details on the advisory council, the advisory council was established in 1992. Our first major grant was to the US Department of Education and it actually established a preliminary longitudinal study which was called the suboptimal outcome study, just as an aside. So we actually have been doing longitudinal work at Ohio State since, since that time. It consists of persons living with brain injury, their family members and advocates who live in Ohio, Virginia, West Virginia, Michigan, Indiana, and Kentucky. And the reason they're beyond Ohio is because of that initial funding. That initial funding was looking at making us a regional center. So we drew people from these different states to get their feedback. And we found that it was very beneficial because what we learned so much from each other, because each of the different states have different resources. They have different ways of setting up their brain injury association um, uh, contacts. They, ha they have um, different vocational rehab re resources, different sources of funding for Medicaid waivers, et cetera. And so when these folks come together from these different states, they're bringing together all these different perspectives and they're really helping us ensure that whatever we're doing is not only relevant to Ohioans, but it's relevant to the larger, at least the region, and hopefully nationally. We also include, in order to ensure a national uh, impact, is the Brain Injury Association of America is also part of our advisory council. So there's always one person, at least one person, often two, from the BIA that comes to our advisory council meetings. So again, the center of our research is really the advisory council. This coming year, as we go to prepare for the next cycle, of competition, they are guiding us in terms of determining what our, our, what we're going to be doing, what our new research projects are going to be. We're gonna be meeting with them here in about a month and ask and presenting some data to them and seeing and seeing what they think would, would be our, some of our, our best choices. Where should we be going forward? What meets their current priorities? Now, the Ohio Regional 2D Man Model System was actually first funded in 1997. And John Corrigan um, got the original funding and he was the uh, project director um, through 2017. I started to become involved myself as a co-project director in the 2000s and now I'm the current project director. Importantly, he was also the executive director for the entire TBI model systems for, for a decade. And um, I, I, just, I like to brag on him, so I'm going to, all of those things that I just went through in terms of those collaborations, he did that in collaboration with Kate Miller at Nidler. All of those reaching out to CDC and the VA, all of those things that are currently there are things that developed under his watch. Um, and I'm very proud of what, um, because of him, what Ohio State has been able to accomplish. In Ohio State, we have 1,340 cases as of June. We are the third highest enrolling site. We sometimes, we kind of um, go back and forth between the one, the first slot and the third slot in terms of um, enrollment. And this is our team. I wanna point out this guy right here, the tallest guy, Mike Mahaffey has been with our team since um, 1993. Um, and he's been our primary follow-up coordinator since that time. Beth Windish over here came soon after that. And then everybody on this team, I, I can't tell you enough about this team. I mean, it's, it's just amazing how well they all work together and pick things up for each other. They're all cross-trained so that everyone can pick things up if someone isn't available and, and they work tremendously well together. If we survived COVID, we can survive everything, right? So I wanna give you a taste of what our local projects have been. Um, next, just to kind of um, go through some finished projects. One of them is uh, involved the OSU TBI identification method. 
Now, this is a method that we've spent some years and one of the projects with TBI model systems involved validating this screening measure for identifying lifetime history of traumatic brain injury. Because we recognized that at the time that we were starting to develop this is that people were having more than one brain injury, but we didn't have a way of detecting that in a valid way. Um, oftentimes people were still thinking even at the time of development that there really was only one brain injury. But if you really talk to folks, you realize that brain injury that brought them to rehab was, was just, you know, could have been the second or third. And folks could have had um, injuries as early as adolescence and childhood that might be impacting what's happening today. So this method for um, identifying t um, lifetime history of TBI was was developed both for research means as well as clinical. Um, it was developed for, um, because we do a lot of work in substance, um, risky substance use and interventions, um, we were finding particularly that, that um, populations tended to have a lot, a lot of um, TBIs in their history. And so we wanted to be able to get a better feel for those TBIs and how that might be impacting how they're functioning today. So the OSU TBI ID was developed. You can learn more about it at this training module here. It's also available in IHIS. Um, this was turned the other way when I loaded it. Um, and I don't have a way of turning it, I don't think. But this is a picture of, yeah, I don't know how to turn it from here. Um, this is a picture of the OSU TBI ID. It's basically a three-step process where um, rather than, before the OSU TBI ID was developed, most people, what they did to find out if someone had a history of TBI is they just said, have you had a TBI before? Or have, had, have you had a concussion before? And they would just use one item to determine their history of TBI. This is developed in a three-step process with multiple items. And the first step is basically um, doing a general overview of that person's injuries throughout their lifetime. And we're trying to make sure that we're capturing all the possible injuries that they might have had before we drill down and determine which of those could have been a traumatic brain injury, which is what we get in step two and three. So first, we're asking them about incidents that might have happened in their life that led to hospitalization, car accidents that they had, violence that they may have been involved in, if they played football or, or, or other sports where they might have had gotten an injury. So we're, we're surveying all the possibilities. And after that, we've gotten them to think thoroughly about all the possibilities in their life, then we go back and we tap into each of those possibilities and ask more about loss of consciousness and age of injury and, and those kinds of things to determine if that person actually had a brain injury at that point. And we do look at um, uh, altered consciousness as well with the TBI identification method. And this is available on the website that I um, showed you before. The OSU TBI ID is very widely used for both nationally and internationally now. Um, the, in the public sector, it's being used by programs who treat people with substance misuse. It's being used within prisons. It's being used um, uh, to, uh, with older adults um, when they're first coming in um, for intakes. Um, and we're also teaching these same public sector service providers what to do when they identify traumatic brain injury. So we've developed uh, training modules um, to show folks how to uh, provide accommodations for individuals who have a history of traumatic brain injury so that you're not only just identifying whether someone had the brain injury, but what to do about it, how to better serve these individuals by accommodating your services to people um, with traumatic brain injury. On the research side, it's also included in the Ohio Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, the Na National Health and Retirement Survey, obviously the TBI model systems. It's a common data element. It's included in track TBI, the Phoenix Toolkit. So um, it's, it's out there and it's in a number of different data sets. Um, it's used in several different national and international pro um, projects. So it has really picked up steam in terms of uh, being a reliable and valid method for detecting lifetime exposure of, of TBI. And every year, 
we find more and more uses for it. So that was one of our local projects. So that was, you know, funded on a very small amount of money and has, um, but its impact has grown exponentially every year. Another local project that I just recently completed or we just recently got accepted for publication is the comparative effectiveness of brief intervention for alcohol misuse. And this was a randomized controlled trial. And we basically, this was an inpatient rehabilitation and we compared um, a screening and brief intervention. So this is a, like a motivational interview an educational interview um, and screening for alcohol misuse um, with, an, um, with a brain health plan. So the, the intervention itself that we were testing um, was one that um, not only focused on, on risky substance use, but also focused on other areas of health such as um, physical activity and nutrition. And the folks left with this interview with, um, with goals um, for changing you know, their use of alcohol or other drugs, as well as changing other health behaviors. And this was a written plan that you cook, took home with them along with some accommodations. So strategies to help them remember to implement their plan. So that was the adapted SBI, and that was compared to screening education and attention control, which is basically a method that we had tested before that had some efficacy, but wasn't fully efficacious in terms of changing um, alcohol use. And essentially what was missing from that is the brain health plan and the motivational interview. What we found with that is that um, the SBI during the course of the year prevented um, a good proportion of folks from returning to alcohol use following brain injury. So if you look at the SEA group, so that's the attention control group, essentially, at three months post-injury, um, uh, less than 20% had regained um, use of alcohol use. And then by six months, it was about 45%. And by 12 months, um, over 60% of individuals in that group had, had, had resumed alcohol misuse. But the people in the SBI group remained about the same throughout the year after discharge from rehabilitation. So by 12 months, twice as many people in the control group were using alcohol compared to people in the, in the experimental group in the SBI intervention. But that's, this was pretty exciting. We're gonna be building upon this study as well. Again, something that was done with a very small budget. Now, here at Ohio State, we've also been involved in a multiple collaborative projects. And, and one of our earliest ones was the TBI practice-based evidence study. Now that was one that was funding, funded by both NIDLR and NIH, and it established a very large 10 center data set that provided detailed information about rehabilitation interventions. It included three TBI model system sites. We led it here at Ohio State. Um, and it provided the basis for understanding the black box of rehabilitation. It, it began to tell us exactly what was happening in inpatient rehabilitation. Well, from there, we did another study with funding through PCORI where we used that data set to actually use advanced statistical methods in order to mimic a randomized controlled trial and begin to identify which rehabilitation approaches could be the most effective. Um, so that was a, a relatively small scale study. It was an analytic study that used the TBI practice-based evidence study. Um, that uh, had because it was an analytic study, it didn't involve additional sites, but it did involve multiple collaborators, primarily clinicians, stakeholders, and persons living with traumatic brain injury. I had 15 different uh, stakeholder collaborators on that study. Around the same time, the PCORI sleep apnea and the BRIGHT study that I told you about before also began, began to develop. Now, as you guys might recall um, with PCORI is that, um, is that initially when PCORI started to fund studies, um, it was kind of slow, we were slow to get started on it. Um, that was true across the United States. 
but Ohio State, we hadn't gotten too many of them yet, and the rest of the United, the United States had not either. Um, when we got it here at Ohio State for TBI, it was one of the first ones that PCORI funded that was related to TBI. And um, because I was part of the model systems, we developed a special interest group um, specifically geared towards understanding um, how we might be able to engage PCORI in additional TBI related research. And because of that, these other two studies were developed. So, you know, we started with these collaborative studies, we got PCORI funding, and because PCORI has so many similar uh, viewpoints and values to what we're doing with Nidler, they picked up on studying um, sleep apnea as well as um, improving discharge following traumatic brain injury. So they became very interested in traumatic brain injury. And some of that was a lot of that was done by Kate Miller with, with Nidler in terms of um, lobbying with PCORI to take a closer look at um, TBI. Well, that has now led to the NIH UG3 UH3 Care for TBI study. This is the study that we just got an award for this week. Um, we just notified on Monday that we started on Wednesday. So it's been a kind of a crazy week here. Um, it is, um, but it drew directly out of these studies here. So small budget TBI model systems, not much bigger budget for the practice-based Evans study, smaller budget for this, to eventually be able to do a relatively larger budget, 15 center site, that's really going to be comparing the treatment approaches. Now we're going prospectively to compare the treatment approaches that are being used in rehabilitation. Um, basically, the, what we're trying to investigate, investigate is the content of therapy, how well it engages patients, and how that will impact outcomes. Again, we're using, um, it's a comparative effectiveness trial. It's not a randomized controlled trial, um, but we're using statistical methods to control bias. So it will be mimicking a randomized controlled trial. 15 out of the 16 model system sites are participating. We have our OBC stakeholders as well. We also have VA representatives. We couldn't include them in the actual data collection because they're in the middle of changing their medical record and that would impact it. It's a $16 million budget. And the biggest, probably the biggest innovation that's gonna come out of this beyond just getting the information about which rehabilitation interventions are effective. And that's huge because we've been working on that since 2000, but also, we're going to be standardizing the electronic medical record documentation of rehabilitation across these different sites. And what that will establish is the ability to continue to do comparative effectiveness studies with traumatic brain injury rehabilitation. And some of the sites are doing it, including Ohio State, are planning to do it across all of the, um, all of the different diagnostic groups if possible. So that, that will really expand our um, research capacity to look at um, the effectiveness of different approaches and different interventions. It can also um, expand program um, development and program evaluation because that data will all now be available to our program managers to see what we're doing that's most effective, what we should not be doing anymore, um, and how we can improve our overall outcomes. So this is a seven-year project. Our first two years is we got to get that EMR documentation um, standardized. So that's going to be a huge ask. And then we'll actually collect the data and analyze the outcome. So I'm gonna be here for at least another seven years. <laughs> All right, so overall, I just, you know, we've got the world's largest longitudinal study of traumatic brain injury outcomes as part of the TBI model systems. Our, the knowledge that has been generated has had a major impact on, on persons living with TBI rehabilitation and outcomes. And we have, ensured that the knowledge that we're generating is getting out to the people who can use it. And by leveraging the infrastructure, right, relatively low budget infrastructure of the TBI model systems, we've been able to exponentially expand its impact um, by uh, collaborating with other funding sources. That's all I have. Do you have any questions? 
Thank you. Great uh, lecture. Really enjoyed learning about the, the model systems. If you guys have questions, you can raise your hand and ask them in person, or you can uh, type in the, the chat and I can read them. Um, let's see. Uh, we do have uh, one chat says, you succeeded in giving a fantastic overview of the forest. And that was from- Oh my gosh. <laughs> Thank you. I have a question about, uh, is there any brain banking done as part of this study? You know, at, at, um, no, you, but okay. there is, but there is um, work heading towards that, um, and and there are, there is there are some sites that are actually doing that um, with additional funding. It's not uh, model systems wide, but there are some sites that are doing that. I don't know as much about it, so I could go into details. Right. But I know they're trying to expand it with additional funding. Yeah, I think. Uh... In neurology, Ben Segal is, is, is working on that through uh, with the NRI to have a brain bank here as part of neurology. And you can then partner with them through studies to, to, to add individuals to the bank. I don't know if that's yeah. in the future. Uh, yeah, that's actually there's something happening right now with the model system where we're talking through some of those things. So it's good to know that. Thanks. Okay, uh, let's see, we have any questions? We have one, per we have one person in the, uh, uh, that wants to talk out loud, it's Michelle Basso. Great. Go ahead, Michelle. I'm trying. Hi, Jenny, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, that was a great overview of model systems and all the important work that you guys have been doing. Um, I'm really excited about the new project. I know you and I talked about it briefly earlier, just not too long ago, but I didn't realize exactly what you were going to be able to accomplish. Um, I, the question I have for you in terms of changing the EMR record and being able to tr track the kind of rehabilitation, are you also going to be able to um, change the EMR to be able to accept different kinds of outcome measures? So not just what kinds of, what therapy is being given, but also how are the therapists measuring that? Because from a program evaluation, that's the place in spinal cord outpatient where we've had to do a lot of work on the EMR. So I was just wondering what, what your ideas are about that. Thanks. Sure. So our primary outcome for the study itself is at follow-up, but um, but we're also going to be measuring outcomes um, during rehab as part of what no naturally happens during rehabilitation, um, where um, therapists are naturally checking to see the impact of their intervention on the, their discharge goals um, and primarily functional outcomes. And so that is plugged into the, um, it's already entered into the medical record, but we're going to try to make sure that we've got um, it in entered in a standardized way. And what I should say about the standardization is that um, the key with that is that we can't add any additional work for the therapist. That's just not gonna work. What we're doing instead is we're looking at ways to standardize it in a way that will involve fewer clicks and fewer narratives for the clinicians to enter. They're gonna be entering the same information they're already entering, only they're gonna be doing it in a more efficient way that also allows us to mine it in a more efficient way rather than having to mine text. Um, but yeah, there are some standardized measures that there are some measures that are used pretty consistently across sites on outcomes during rehab. Um, and those are the ones that we're going to be taking advantage of um, to be looking at um, continuous change. So the final static change will be at one year post injury. But we're also looking at um, continuous change in the recovery trajectory during inpatient rehab. Yeah. Um, have you examined the interaction between um, substance use and uh, TBI and then later in life neurodegenerative diseases? Um, yes. Yes, that was done in one of the uh, recent studies. and. It, that particular study didn't show a relationship, um, but I, I, you know, 
I don't believe it. <laughs> I believe that, I mean, it obviously has, um, risky alcohol use obviously has been found to increase your, your chances of developing all kinds of conditions. Um, but that particular study, and it was just our beginning of looking at longitudinal tra trajectories, didn't show relationship. I am sure that there is um, a relationship. And, and I'm just thinking of one study here. There could be others that actually did find a relationship. Other questions? Uh, there's one in the chat uh, from Ginger Yang. Great talk and great work. Is there any discussion or plan to include children in the TBI model system in the future? Oh, I wish. Uh, that's been talked about for years. Um, no, um, not for this TBI model system because it's always been adult. Um, and that's where those particular funds are. They have, um, for years, they've talked about trying to develop something, uh, a unique one for children. Um, and it, you know, there, there's different funds that have been directed towards that, but nothing, um, nothing that's truly a TBI model system. In terms of uh, data that you get out of this, can you, like when you say you lose people, people drop, drop out of the study, is that because you can't find them or they drop out because they pass away? I mean, is, is there, is there, do you track that if someone, I mean, is there a way to know, I mean, does TBI, I guess, because I'm, I'm interested in aging and lifespan, I mean, does TBI reduce lifespan? Is that data that you can get out of, of all 18,000 people you're studying? I mean, you're studying them over 30 years, you can get, basically, you imagine you'll get a mortality. In right, there. right. So we, we actually do um, get death certificates um, for folks once we've learned that they're dead. And if when we go to follow folks, we're um, looking at, in a number of different places to figure out if we're having difficulty finding them where they might be. That includes the social security death index, um, as well as checking with family members, et cetera. But um, the reasons for lo lo losing them can be death. It can be um, that they've gone to prison and we can't follow them when they're in prison. Um, it can be that they don't wanna to talk to us anymore and sometimes they just hang up on us, that happens. Um, the people that we can't get data from, um, our systematic bias studies are frequently, um, it, it is folks with ri risky substance use, um, oftentimes, um, and, uh, generally people who are, are more mobile, um, so the more, uh, functionally intact they are, the more likely we're going to be, uh, they, that they could be lost. People who've gone back to work, sometimes they're harder to reach, um, but we actually um, structure our follow-up so that we, we call people in the morning, afternoon, evening, and weekends um, until we reach them. So we've got a lot of strategies for getting around those problems. So there is some bias, um, certainly associated with the attrition, um, but we've done a lot of work to reduce that bias. Um, in order to have the cleanest data set we can. Okay, great. Uh, do we have any more questions? Any, I don't see raised hands, any thing in the Q&A. Kate, are you seeing anything? No, I think that's all the questions. Well, great. Uh, thanks so much, Dr. Magner. Great talk. Really enjoyed listening or learning more about the model systems. I've heard about it for years, but now I think I actually I have a very good understanding of, of what's going on up there and congrats on the, the grant. That's, that's great news. Oftentimes, you know, the administrators always, you know, look away when you have some of these grants that don't bring in a lot of money, but the basis is always let, that you use those to get the bigger grants. That's exactly, right. exactly what you've done. So congrats. And uh, we'll see everybody next week um, for NT RIPS. Chris Martins is presenting from Department of Neuroscience. So, Everybody have a great weekend and we'll see you soon. Thank you.